Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. You're like, wait a second, I thought we were going to Ruth. Well, we're going to, uh, we're going to the other R pass, other R scriptures here. So we've been making our way through a beautiful story as God kind of guides us through the book of Ruth. Uh, walking through the daily lives of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. So even though God has His hand in these stories, in the choices that are made, intentional or otherwise, we know that we have an impact on the outcome in our own lives. Just like the choices of Naomi, the choices of Elimelech, the choices of their sons, the choices of even Boaz, who we were introduced to last week. Even though God's hand is in all of these stories, their impact comes from their choices as well. In week one, we looked at Ruth chapter one, and the key theme came from Proverbs 14 verse 12, which was, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. We saw that our choices have consequences, again, not just for ourselves, but for those that are around us. And not just those that are around us, but also our future generations, our legacy. The choices that we make today will impact our legacy in the future. But we also saw that God, through God, through returning to God, through coming back to Him in humility, hope can be renewed. Last week, we got into another theme, Proverbs 16, 9, which says, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. And we saw God moving through space and time to have Ruth go glean in a particular field that just happened to be the field of a guy named Boaz. And God is working through for our good and His glory, even in the daily grind. This week we'll dive into yet another theme from Proverbs, Proverbs 19, verse 21, which says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes that prevail. In this great love story that God has, not just for Ruth and Boaz, but for us, God has given you and I the ability to look into the future, the ability to go, okay, what am I going to do today? My daughter, even right before I came up here, she's like, hey, so what are we doing today? I want to go to Ross with my mom. I want to do this. I want to do that. She's got plans. And I'm like, I'm planning to preach. Just talk to me after service. You know what I mean? But we all make plans. We all have plans, what we want to do, what we're going to do. The decisions that we make, whether to go right or left, whether, whether one way or the other, in the end, it's God who establishes those plans. Now, that doesn't mean that the plans that you make are established by God. That means that the result of those plans, if they're good, that's because God made them good. Because God can't do evil. God either allows things to happen or He causes things to happen for our good and His glory. And one way or the other, we know that God is going to get the glory. Our job as disciples is to make sure that our plans are lined up with God's plans. And this is why I wanted you to turn to Romans chapter 12. Look here in verse 1. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to view God's mercy. We'll get into this a little bit later, but let me give you a little taste. The only reason you are alive today is because of the mercy of God. You did not do a thing to get you here today. God did it all. Now, you chose, yes, to come here. Yes, you chose to make the decisions to wear what you're wearing and, and all these kinds of things. But the only reason that each and every one of us are breathing today is because of the mercy of God. He says, Because of God's mercy, because of the great love and the great grace that He's lavished on each and every one of us today, what should we do? What should our response be to this mercy of God? It should be to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Okay, well, great. So where's the altar? 
Where, where's the knife? Well, it's not that kind of living sacrifice. Here's the living sacrifice. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. This is repentance. Stop doing the things that are contrary to the mercy of God. Not just doing them, but true repentance is metanoia. It's a change of mind that results in a change of behavior. I could care less about somebody's behavior. Because your behavior will never change unless your mind changes. We study the Bible with people all the time that get God. That understand God. God isn't complicated. There are people that make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year because they make God complicated and they sell books to try to make God uncomplicated. God is not complicated. I am not a smart man. For me to get up here and preach is not like some crazy whiz bang. Oh my gosh, he's got some sort of mystical knowledge. No, 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 no. You guys could preach the exact lesson that I'm preaching right now. It's not complicated. But Satan makes it complicated. It's an issue of repentance. Change your mind that results in a change of behavior. Your fruit issues are really root issues. The fruit of your life is not an issue of what you do. It's how you think. And he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. You're either following the ways of the world or you're following the ways of God. There is no in-between. There is no gray area. You cannot walk the fence. You cannot be religious. You cannot be godly. You cannot go to church. You cannot do all these religious things and yet still operate from a worldly mindset. But yet the religious world will say, oh, well, just try. Hey, you come into church, you believing in Jesus, that's enough. There's a lot of people in my life that I believe in that I want nothing to do with. So why would I want to spend eternity with someone that I want nothing to do with, but that I believe in? That's, heaven and hell really is that. Why would a loving God, why would a loving God send somebody to hell? That's the wrong question. Why would you want to spend the rest of your life with someone that you did not want to spend your earthly life with? That's the question. That's the real question. People want to make it about God. No, it's about you. It's about me. God is not the issue. We are the issue. Why? Because we have not been renewed in the attitude of our minds. He says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When we are living our lives for God, we will know what to do. We will know His will for our lives. And the Bible says His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Is your will good, pleasing, and perfect? Look at the fruit of your life. That will show whether your will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Today's lesson is on this idea of the basic law of God is when we are righteous, we will receive a reward from Him. When we, receive, we will receive His protection, His provision. When we make righteous plans, God will provide His righteous provision. And that's the title of the lesson. Righteous plans, righteous provision. Amen? Amen. Go to Ruth chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3. We're going to dive into this. Look here in verse 1. Point number one is making godly plans. Making godly plans. Ruth 3, verse 1. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, now just as a, as a side note, between chapter 2 and chapter 3, there's been about a good two, three months span of time. So just understand the passage of time. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter... I must find a home for you, where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. Then, when he lies down, note the place where he's lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, 
he will tell you what to do. The fact that Naomi is making his plans, making this plan, shows that Naomi is in much better spirits than she was originally. Remember in chapter 1, she, she gets all fired up, right? Life is terrible. She's lost her husband. She's lost her kids. There's no, there's no progeny. There's no children. She has no life. There's nothing for her in Moab. And she hears through the grapevine that God has come back to the people of Israel and has caused there to be now bread in the house of bread again. And she gets kind of a, a little bit of hope. And she goes back. And then in chapter 2, she's just sitting there. End of chapter 1, she's like, don't call me Naomi, which means sweetness. Call me Mara, which means bitter. I'm just going to be a bitter old woman. All right? That's my thing. That's, that's my jam. That's, what, that's, that's how I'm going to live. Not a good spot. But she gets a little bit more hope, you know, because Ruth is like, hey, I got to do it. I, maybe she just wanted to get out of the house. You know what I mean? Like, dang, I can't handle this anymore. You know, you ever have that roommate that just constantly is just like irritating, <laughs> always resentful about something. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. Ah, you know what I mean? Like, I just got to get out of here. But she's like, we got, I got to go to work. I got to go to work. I got to go do something. And I read somewhere that in the law of God, there's this thing called gleaning. I'm going to go glean in somebody's field. And so she goes and gleans all day, and she gets all this, this grain, and right, we know the story. She meets with great favor with Boaz, and all of a sudden, they're having this conversation, and Naomi goes, oh, who, who, who'd, you go, who'd you go hang out with today? Oh, I went to this place, uh, this guy named Boaz in this field, and Boaz, wait a second. That, he's a redeemer. He's a guardian redeemer. And so you could tell the, the hope just kind of welling up a little bit here. But Naomi is making a plan, and it shows that she's now no longer Mara. She's back to Naomi. She's no longer bitter, but she's hopeful. In Ruth 2.20, we read this, right? The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. You know, as a leader, I have four primary tasks in leading this church. Four primary tasks. Number one is I have to breathe out faith. I have to, I guess. I get to. I get to breathe out faith. Number two is create the miracle. Number three is hold to the standard. Number four is raise up leaders. Everything that I do boils down to those four tasks. And let me tell you what they are. Number one, breathe out faith. My job, not just on a Sunday, but every single day I meet with the disciple. I'm on campus. My job is to breathe out faith. I should be the most faithful person in the room. When I'm studying the Bible with somebody, my job is to breathe faith into them through the scriptures. Breathing out faith. Helping people go from Mara back to Naomi. Or keep them from going from Naomi to Mara. That's breathing out faith. Number two is creating the miracle. Now, I, in and of myself, do not have any power, nor does anybody right. have power to do miracles. <laughs> Miraculous signs are dead and they're gone. Now, God can do whatever he wants to do. Mm. He can do whatever he wants to do. But as humans, we do not have the power to raise the dead, heal the sick, etc., etc. Otherwise, I'd be back there touching Rocky, praying a prayer, and he'd be healed. Right. Yeah. Done deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'd have some of y'all like come and pray for me because my back hurts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Take some Advil, do some stretches, have a good time. You know what I mean? God loves you. But creating the miracle means I need to be working out where can I help somebody see a miracle of God in their life? Where can I help somebody change? Where can I help somebody repent? Where can I help somebody make decisions to follow Jesus? Well, how can I help somebody get that resume looking sweet so that they can get a job, which in this economy is a miracle? How can I, okay, this brother likes this sister. Okay, okay, let me figure it out. All right, how do, I, how do we make this matchmaker thing go? Oh, boom, they started dating. Boom, creating the miracle. Right here. Miracles. Miracles are happening every single day. Come on, bro. And they're not mystical. They're not whimsical. They're wonderful, yes. But my job is to create an atmosphere where miracles are happening. 
by the power of God. Hold to the standard. That simply means we obey what the Bible says to do. And if anybody in this church, including myself, is not holding to the standard, we have a nice, lovely conversation in the Lord. Not just that, but I preach and teach what the Lord expects how we should operate. Does this make sense? That's holding to the standard. I don't just hold myself to the standard. I hold the rest of the church to the standard. And as a family, we hold one another to the standards. And then ultimately raising up leaders. We need more and more and more people to raise up to help other people become disciples. Ruth was not aware of my formula of leadership. And yet she was doing exactly this. She had been breathing out faith and creating the miracles as she got to work trusting in the promises of God in how she would how God would take care of her people through gleaning. So she's like, hey, this is a promise of God. I believe it. I'm going to go do it. She goes and does it, reaps the rewards, brings it back to, uh, 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 to Naomi. Naomi, she's now breathing out faith in Naomi. She created the miracle by getting to work and doing what God had called her to do. We'll come back to this lesson later, but she was obeying the word of God and therefore she could claim the promises of God. I mentioned this earlier. Our religious world today wants to be able to claim the promises of God without at the very least understanding the conditions of those promises. God's promises are unconditional. Lie from hell. That is not true. Every single promise of God is conditional. You cannot accept the blood of Jesus to wash your sins away without doing, actually changing your life. That's a condition. A free gift is conditioned upon you accepting the gift. But accepting the gift means more than just, oh, thanks, and walking away, playing with your toy as if nothing ever happened. Every single promise of God has a condition associated with it. And that condition, honestly, is wonderful. Mm, It actually is for our good and His glory. This is why our religious world is full of men and women who have a form of godliness but deny its power. Mm. Naomi sees a great opportunity for Ruth to be provided for in this situation with news that she has been noticed by Boaz. Hope began to glimmer in her heart over the course of the few months that Ruth was there gleaning in the the fields of Boaz. I mean, if you look at the word home there, if you look in your Bible, there's a, it should be a a letter or a number next to it. If you've got a a, a decent Bible, it's got a footnote there. And in Hebrew, it says, find rest. Find rest. So he says, one day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, my daughter, I must find rest for you. Today, this is super controversial. Wow. Think about it for a second. Find rest how? In a home as a wife. Excuse me? Yep. I'm an independent woman. Oh, no. I mean, I'm not an independent woman. <laughs> but modern feminism... Modern feminism has sold women a lie that says, you go get yours, girl. You don't need a man. You don't need a man. In fact, you don't need a man, you need a woman. I'll leave that there. But modern femininity is not biblical femininity. Now, this does not mean you need to be barefoot and pregnant with food on the, ca- on the, ca- on the kitchen counter. No. That's not femininity either. Right. Yeah. Right. But we've swung the pendulum so far. Yeah. Come on in. God's way always provides rest. Yeah. Come on. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody in this room is ever going to get married. That's okay. Yeah. Ultimately, we find our rest in Christ. But just the simple fact that Naomi was trying to play matchmaker is one thing, but to help her get married. Again, the word in Hebrew here is rest, finding rest. She wanted to help her find rest, a godly wife of a godly husband. You try to share that kingdom dream in your school, in your workplace, in your family, and that's a surefire way for you and I to get persecution. Mm -hmm. God's way is always the right way. And in that right way, we find rest. Now, many people don't want to get married. They don't want to go down that path 
because of the marriage of their family. Right. I, 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 let, me, let me be honest. If we go back to our own families, do we find a godly wife and a godly husband? Then, then what you're trying to do is you're trying to put, put God's way down by elevating Satan's way. You can't look at somebody doing it the wrong way and go, I'm not doing it. Yes, say, I'm not doing it that way. I'm going to do it the right way. Right. Just because it went bad for you doesn't mean that that is the model that should be followed. Right. Just because your parents weren't the model relationship doesn't mean that there is not a model relationship out there for you to follow. Right. Ruth and Boaz is that good example. Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What is Jesus saying here? Do it my way, and you will have rest. Yeah. Try to go your own way. Try to go the religious world's way. You're not going to find rest. God's way is the right way. Rest only comes from living the way God has designed it. Today, more and more people are staying single. Choosing not to marry, not to live in a committed relationship, or at least, as my mother-in-law told Ariel before we got married, at least, hey, aren't you going to you know, test drive the car before you buy it? Data suggests that for the first time in our nation's history that the majority of adults are single and not married. The average male is getting married at 30 years old, the average woman in her late 20s. Now, the data also suggests that 9 out of 10 singles will get married, but that, that marriage will come after living together for 10 years. This is not God's plan. It never was, and it never will be. God wants all of us to find rest in our homes. That does not mean necessarily, again, that marriage is in the future, but we will find ultimate rest in Christ and in doing what He has called us to do, in taking His yoke upon us. Naomi knows that in the long run, she has to let Ruth go and find rest in another home, one that can provide ultimate provision. So she comes up with a risky plan. Doesn't hope make you do really risky things? Doesn't like excitement make you like kind of go, oh, oh, well, what about this? And what about that? And you're like, people are looking at you going, that's crazy, man. That's crazy talk. But Naomi saw Boaz taking notice. Now she didn't visually see it, but she saw the great gifts that she was given, the, the plentiful amount of, of grain that she was given after she would come home from working for Boaz. Now here's what's kind of interesting. Boaz is quite a bit older. You know that by, as you read, you hear him call Ruth, my daughter, right? So it wasn't going to be Boaz that was going to propose to Ruth. Typically, that's kind of what happens, is the guy proposes to the gal, and life goes on happily ever after, right? But that's not what was going to happen in this story. So Naomi understands, hey, Ruth is quite a bit younger. Boaz is quite a bit older. So... In that society, it would have been frowned upon for Boaz to ask for Ruth. And so Naomi has a plan to help Ruth uh, propose to Boaz. And you know what, guys? Boaz is the catch. He's the ultimate catch. Check it out. I mean, think about this for a minute. Sisters, sisters, ladies, think about this for a minute. He's a godly man with a job. I mean, what do you want? What, you, what more do you want? Amen, Amen brothers. All right. But was as crazy as this plan was, Ruth was all in. Second point, look at verse 5. We just looked at a godly plan, making godly plans. Now we're going to look at following godly people. Ruth chapter 3, look here in verse 5. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. 
Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and laid down. You know, what I find absolutely awesome here is the depth of trust and communication between Ruth and Naomi. I hadn't seen this before. But if you read back through it again, you'll see like everything. They're just talking about everything. I mean, when is there a verse that comes by that doesn't say, hey, how did it go? Hey, where did you go today? Oh, hey, you should do this. Hey, my daughter, I need to do this. They're constantly in communication. Their relationship is so close. My brothers and sisters, this is how our relationships in the kingdom should be, especially our discipling partners, our spiritual mentors, those in our households, those that live with us on a day-to-day basis. This is the kind of relationship that you have with the man or woman who mentors you in the Lord. Is this what it looks like? Hey, how did it go today? Oh, it went this way. Hey, like the constant back and forth communication? Or do you just talk at your weekly D times? Discipling relationships are not just a one-way communication thing. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 says, Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the Word should share all good things with their instructor. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Hey, you have an awesome quiet time? Hey, <laughs> kick it my way. I'm fired up to hear it. Right. You know what I mean? There's a back and forth communication. There's a trust. There's a conversation. This should be our hearts, not just the teacher sharing with the student, but the student sharing with the teacher. Naomi and Ruth had good, healthy, open, honest communication. I love this about their relationship. And a wonderful byproduct of this was trust. Mm -hmm. This was a crazy plan. This was a risky plan. And it wasn't even guaranteed to work. And Ruth was all in. She's like, let's do, let's go. I'm all in, let's do it. Mm -hmm. This is the heart of true discipleship. Mm -hmm. This is the heart of true love for one another. No second guessing, no mistrusting of motives, just pure love and care that results in complete trust. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's go, babe. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look here in verse 1. Some of us might think that love is a feeling. Love is an emotion. (laughs) But it's not. This is what love is. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, we also have a religiously wrong view of love. Love is not tolerance. Love is not tolerance. In my love for one another, I hold to the standard. In my love for one another, I help people see truth. It says, love is patient, love is kind. How do I do this, though? Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. The Bible says love always trusts. The Bible also says in Proverbs 27, 6, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. What does that mean? That means if you have a really good friend, they're going to tell you like it is. They're going to be honest with you. They're going to be real with you. And you can trust that hurt. Because all an enemy is going to do is just make things sound really awesome and good. No, keep going that way. It's great. You're doing okay. Hey, man, you're not doing anything that anybody else wouldn't do. We often push back from those that love us enough to speak the truth to us, and this hinders our growth in life and in our plan for protection that God has for us. Wow. Hebrews 13, 17 says, have confidence in your leaders. If you look at that in a more literal translation, it simply just says, obey your leaders. But my leader's dumb. Well, then you don't trust. And he might be. I already said at the jump, I'm not the smartest guy around. Have confidence in your leaders. Trust them. And submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Ultimately, anybody who leads 
especially in the church, has to give an account to God yes. wow. for the direction and the decisions that they make. Yeah. That should scare every one of us, yeah. and especially me, and it does. It says, do this so that there will could be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. We all have men and women who are leaders in our life who look after us in the Lord's. The Bible calls us to obey them, or in the NIV it says have confidence in them so that you may benefit from your obedience to them. Well, wait, if I obey them, aren't they getting the benefit? No, you're getting the benefit. Because the opposite is of no benefit. If a spiritual person gives you advice, and it's not unethical, immoral, unbiblical, or otherwise harmful, just do it. And especially if they show you a scripture that is right in line with how you should be operating. Right. Proverbs 19, verse 20 says, Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. Notice it's just not listening, but accepting it. Yeah. Accepting it in deep, and then that's changing the way that I operate. Right. Proverbs 28, 26, Those who trust in themselves are fools, the Bible says. But those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. It's not enough just to get advice. You must follow it. It's not enough just to listen to advice. You have to accept it and walk in it. Then you will be counted among the wise and kept safe, the Bible says. To use the word that Naomi told Ruth, then you will be at rest. Ruth could have figured things out on her own. She understood the scriptures enough to go gleaning. Right? But she decided that she was going to put herself under authority. Wow. The authority of this bitter old woman named Naomi. Who wasn't the best of spiritual leaders for most of the book. Would you agree? And yet she still submitted herself to this crazy, wacky plan of this kind of almost coming out of being bitter woman. That does not sound awesome. But yet God sees that as wonderful. Now let's talk for a minute about what's going on here with this threshing floor. So back in the day, what they would do is they would, they would gather the harvest and they just pile it up. And then what they would do is they would take those piles of wheat or barley, whatever it is, and they would bring it to a place called the threshing floor. I know this is a really pixelated image, but I think you get the idea. Typically, it was up higher on a, either, either they've made a big mound and they put something up top, or it was up on a mountain top or something like that. You could go pictures of it and they're all over the place. But it was a hard stone surface where they would put all the wheat and they would just like stomp on it, beat it with sticks, and they would like do all these kind of things, you know, to it to try to separate the actual grain from the rest of the, the stalk and the leaves and the the, the chaff, right? If you, biblical you know, term, uh, nobody uses the word chaff nowadays, but it's the outer husk of the wheat or the barley. And because the grain itself was heavier, they would kind of, after they beat it for a while, they'd kind of take forks and shove it up in the air and let it kind of drop down. And what would happen is that the breeze would blow the chaff away. It would blow the leaves away. It would blow everything else away. And that the grain would fall to the ground and they would gather it up. They beat it again and throw it up again. Right? That's what they would do. So after that was happening, that was happening during a time of feasting. All the guys would be out. They'd, they'd be, you know, obviously roasting some of the grain and having a good time, drinking a little bit. You know, that water wasn't really good back then. Uh, water is good and should be good, and it was good in some places. But uh, it was a time of festivities. It was a time of celebration. And so what would happen, though, is afterwards you'd have all this pile of grain here in the middle, and there would be a ring, obviously you see the ring, but a ring of guys that would be sleeping head towards the grain pile, legs out. Why? Because you've got a just nice little pile of grain here that's quite a bit away from town because it's got to be up in high area. What's going to happen? Somebody could come and steal all your grain. Or, you know, animals could come and take it. So they would protect the grain until they were able to put it into sacks or jars or whatever it was. And so this is the scene, the scene that we find Na uh, Ruth coming to. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So Ruth was to go and meet Boaz at this threshing floor 
after he'd celebrated and was resting. And, uh, and so Ruth chapter 3, look here in verse 8. Point number 3, receiving godly protection. Wow, come on. Following this risky yet godly plan would lead to receiving godly protection. Look here in verse 8. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned and there was a woman lying at his feet. Now that would be weird. <laughs> Who are you, he asked. I am your servant Ruth. She said, spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a uh, guardian redeemer for our family. This is probably the coolest passage in this chapter. We already know that Ruth would have to propose to Boaz since he was an older man and it would have been unbecoming of him to do so. So she lays at his feet until he wakes up. And basically this is her proposal. I'm Ruth. You're my relative. The Bible says you're a guardian redeemer. Marry me so that I can come under your protection. It's essentially what she was saying. Now, the language she uses here is interesting. Two two particular points. Number one is if you remember back in chapter two, when Boaz is talking to Ruth, she says in Ruth, or he says in Ruth chapter two, verse 12, may the Lord repay you for what you have done, speaking of the kindness of of Ruth leaving Moab, leaving everything behind, and coming and being with Naomi. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Under whose wings was a phrase that Boaz had used. And it's kind of interesting, the words that are in verse 9, I am your servant Ruth, she said, spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer. Now, if you look at that in any other translation other than the NIV, you will see that it says, spread your wings over me. Wow. This phrase is used 34 times in the Old Testament, and all but one of them are wings. And even when it talks about garment, it's using the same language. But little did Boaz know that he would be the very one. Even though he says this to Ruth, he would be the very wings that God would use to cover over Ruth. Go to Ezekiel chapter 16. One of these meanings, one of the usage of this this phrase is here in Ezekiel 16 verse 8. And again, because most of us are reading the NIV, it's going to use the word garment, but just go with it. Later I passed by, and when I looked at you, I saw that you were old enough for love. This is God talking to the people of Israel. I spread the corner of my garment. I spread my wings over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. Now, if you read a little earlier, it's talking about Israel is not in a good place. They're kicking around in their own blood. They're being strangled by their, by their own just nothingness. And God sees them, and God comes and protects and spreads his wings over them. This is not the conniving, bitter mother-in-law trying to make a play against a rich man who happens to have the hots for for her, her daughter. And it's not a risque Moabite woman trying to get a sugar daddy. This is, she's calling him to be her guardian redeemer. This is a covenantal relationship that she is trying to go after. Now, what does that mean, guardian redeemer? Go to Deuteronomy 25. Come on, honey. Come on, bro. What is a guardian redeemer? Some of your uh, translations might say kinsman redeemer. Leviticus 25.25 says this, If one of your fellow Israelites becomes poor and sells some of their property, their nearest relative is to come and redeem what they have sold. Okay, so that's part of it. But Deuteronomy 25, look here in verse 5. It says, If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not marry, want to marry his, his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at that town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. 
he will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elder of this town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, this brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face, and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. Dang. Just strange. Yep. This is the OG chancla right here. <laughs> so, so the idea is, does it, does it make sense what's happening? In, in order to preserve the legacy of the family line of the brother, the brother-in-law was to take on the sister-in-law as a wife, and the first son then would be able to continue that family line. And it was the responsibility of the brother. Now, this was a requirement for brothers. It was not a requirement for relatives. Wow. Now, later it became a requirement for relatives, but in this time, it was not a requirement, although it was expected that you would just do this. But it wasn't necessarily frowned upon if you did not. Naomi and Ruth took a chance that Boaz would take up this responsibility even though he did not have to. Wow. Go back to Ruth chapter 3. Come on, bro. Ruth chapter 3. Look here in verse 10. What was his response? Because he could have responded in any way. How dare you? Who do you think you are? I let you glean in my field and you think that you've got this right? Da -da -da -da. Wow. What was his response? Look in verse 10. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Wow. Boaz was taken aback by his request. He was greatly humbled, and he was fired up. <laughs> Ruth could have gone and just done what the culture had done. Young woman, younger man. Rich or poor, it doesn't matter. Could have found anybody. But instead, she chose to obey the law of God. She, she chose to obey the law of Moses in this matter. Now, I'm sure that there was mutual attraction. Again, she's not trying to get a sugar daddy here. But we see again her character. And we also see his character. This is a worthy man marrying a worthy woman. For whatever reason, God has allowed this man to stay single. We don't know from either history or the text that this guy was ever married. Wow. And so by the power of God, he just has remained single, waiting for the right one. Wow. He didn't just want a good time, he wanted a good legacy. Wow. And so he waited so that he could be equally yoked, as we use the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Wow. These two were equally yoked. They were a match made in heaven. And God was behind the scenes making this match. Check out what happens next. Chapter 3, verse 12. Although it is true that I am a garden redeemer of your family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said to her, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. How cool is this? He's done his homework. I mean, how would he know if he wasn't next in line if he didn't go and figure it out? Right. So he was like secretly hoping. Maybe it was in his prayers at nights. He was having his quiet time in the morning going, okay, God, I'm, you're going to come through here. Not only did he do the research to find this out, but we see that he guards her purity. He guards her reputation. Mm. He could have totally taken advantage of the situation. And how many of us, not show of hands, rhetorical question, amen. Yes. How many of us are like, oh, well, I, I, we're going to get married anyway. Let's just, oh, let's just have a little fun. No. 
Oh, I love this guy. Uh -oh. So why not? Well, it was dark. Mm. He was maybe a little tipsy. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Not saying that's a good thing, but you know, it is what it is. Could have totally taken advantage of her situation, but yet he didn't. Even he caught on that she was a little uncomfortable because what does the Bible say? It says here, so she lay, verse 14, at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. So she's probably sleeping at his feet, still at his feet, not side by side, at his feet. And she's kind of like one of those sleepless nights where you kind of nod off, but you wake up because you... You know, you, you, you don't want to sleep through your alarm because you got an interview in the morning or something like that. You, go, you know what I'm saying? And so he catches on and he says, hey, hey, go. You got to go. Yeah. No problem. That's awesome. Wow. He wants to make sure that she gets home safe. It being late at night, he tells her to stay at his feet. And seeing that she was feeling a little uncomfortable, like I just mentioned, she got up before they was recognized and sends her off. Mm -hmm. okay. Here is the reality, my sisters, and pay attention to this. If a man is willing to do what it takes to be with you the right way, he will be willing to do what it takes to stay with you. Yeah, there it is. If a man is unwilling to do what it takes to be with you the right way, you can guarantee that he will not be there in the long run. Come on. You know, my quiet time and research for this lesson, I read a wonderful quote. It said, duty will make you do things well, but love will make you do things beautifully. What I find beautiful about the end of their exchange is that he understands that he's going to take on the responsibility of being the redeemer for Ruth. But he also understands that Ruth comes with some baggage. The world would say that Ruth comes with a baggage, the bitter mother-in-law. But what does he do? He also knows that he's going to take care of mother-in-law. And so what does he do? He says this act of pouring out barley for Naomi is significant, right? Look at verse 15. He said also, bring to me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When, he, when she did so, she poured out, he poured out into six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her, then went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Do not go back to your mother-in-law. So who's this barley for? Not for Ruth. It's for the mother-in-law. Wow. Saying, hey, I'm not just going to take care of you, Ruth. I'm going to take care of your mother-in-law. This act of pouring out barley for Naomi is, is significant because it's a sign that he is not just going to pour life into Ruth as he fights to take her as his wife. And as a redeemer, we'll see this next week, but he's also going to pour life into Naomi. Final point, look at verse 18, waiting with godly patience. Ruth 3.18. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Remember back in chapter 2, we spoke about the name of Boaz and what it meant? Ruth 2, verse 1, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. We know that he was a man of standing. The Bible says he was a man of valor, a man of excellence. But his, that, that's his reputation. That's not his name. His name means quickly. Which, what does that mean? That means he was a man of action. Indeed, Boaz has and will continue to live up to his name. You know, not many of us like to wait especially for matters of the heart. Especially when there's a lot riding on what you're waiting for. The Bible calls us again and again to be patient, to wait for God. Isaiah 64 verse 4, Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen what God, seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for Him. And we cannot forget the most famous passage of Scripture on waiting on God, Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I challenge you 
to look up any passage in the Bible that deals with waiting on God and find me one where the outcome is negative. You cannot find one. Wow. Not one. Waiting is a godly quality. But again, for some of us, especially when it comes to relationships, we like to take matters into our own hands. I want to encourage you through the story of Boaz and Ruth that God has a plan. You just got to wait for him. But you know what? We're not the only ones that have to wait. Did you know that God waits? Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. God waits. Second Peter chapter 3, look here in verse 8. Peter says to the family of churches, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a war. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought we to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Wow. How long was God patient with you when you lived in ignorance and unrepentance? before you became a disciple, before you studied the Bible, before you truly, truly had a relationship with God? How long did you fight against His love and care, His provision, His protection, while you were rejecting Him and pushing Him away by your sin? Or maybe you're still there. You know what you should do. You know that you need to repent and turn to Him. You know you need to stop sinning. You know you need to walk in the light. You know you need to get right with God, and yet you're dragging your feet. Or worse yet, you're being outright rebellious. Romans 2 verse 4 says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? The word contempt is to view something as beneath consideration. You view God's mercy, His compassion, His forbearance, and His tenderness towards you as something to be walked all over because you ignore it so that you can live your life, not the life that He has for you. Forbearance is His patient self-control. Wow. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The way that you live your life deserves His wrath and yet he bears with it, hoping that you will change. But again, we think he's tolerant, that he has somehow accepts my behavior because he hasn't annihilated me yet. No, 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 that's his grace, that's his love, that's his mercy, that's his forbearance. Yeah. Come on. This is the reason why he sent Jesus. His kindness is what he was hoping would lead you to repentance. Yes, Boaz is the guardian redeemer in the story of Ruth, but Jesus is our guardian redeemer. And by the surrender of his own life, he redeemed us. Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. He purchased us back. There was not any penny that we could offer. Our debt was so huge that there was nothing that we could do to repay it. And yet he paid the debt we could never repay. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. But he did not just redeem us to go about our own way and continue to live the life we were living. 1 Peter verse 1, chapter 1, verse 18 says, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. God did not use wealth and riches to redeem us. He used His own Son. Not just to, empty, not just to redeem you so you could go on living the way that you had, were with this get-out-of-hell-free card called Jesus but so that you could no longer live the empty way of life, but live life to the full. Come on. 
He redeemed us so that we could live a life of provision and protection, living His righteous plan for our lives. My friends, as we look to the story of Boaz and Ruth and Naomi, I want us to see our story in this. All of us have made a mess of our lives. All of us. Living our own way, making our own decisions, living with the consequences of those decisions, while God's hand is at work behind the scenes in our daily lives, hoping that we will turn to Him and find true protection and true provision. And when we do, we find that He is leading us and guiding us, taking care of us in His kingdom, and ultimately our Boaz, Jesus, choosing, though He did not have to, to be our Redeemer so that we can be taken care of. You know, as we take communion this morning, I want us to think of the areas of our lives that God has been patient with us. Acts 3.19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Let's choose to repent so that we can have great refreshment in our lives. As we'll see next week, great refreshment is going to come in the story of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi. But God does not just want the story to be that, a great story. He wants that to be our great story with Him. As we walk in His righteous plan for our lives, He wants to give us His righteous righteous provision. Let's pray for our time of communion. Amen. Amen.